recording again. Okay. Let's just wait for uh, four o'clock uh, uh, sharp. Yeah, sure. sure. Okay, maybe I should introduce myself. Hi, I'm Yang Zizhou. I'm the last chair in this uh, wonderful conference and uh, uh, I'm a, a postdoc in the CNTC. Okay. Uh, so just waiting for a bit. Okay, um, that's a resume and let me introduce the speaker. Uh, so our next speaker is a professor Vigeroth from Otto University. He's an expert uh, on using the low temperature STN to probe the atomic scale structure, nanostructure, and uh, et cetera, and exploring interest in physics. Today, he's going to tell us about topological superconductivity in the designer van der Waal heterostructures. Please go ahead, uh, Peter. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so thanks, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's really nice to be able to, to tell you about our research. And then before I go on with, with my talk, uh, maybe one thing. So usually when I say that I come from other university, people ask, where is that? And, and in fact, that's the wrong question. So the right question should be, who is that? And that's, that's Oliver Aldo. It's a Finnish designer and architect. And the university is a, is a relatively new merger uh, between Helsinki University of Technology, the School of Economics and Art and Design School. So, so we are, I mean, this physics department is from the University of Technology side. So we are located in the capital area in, in Finland. So, so that's, that's where I come from. So but let's go on with, with today's talk. So uh, before I start, let me tell you who actually did all the work in the lab. So, uh, group of about 10 people working with low temperature scanning tunnel and microscopes. And, and the work today, all this is starts with the topological superconductivity. Shabulienu, who is a, a research uh, fellow in the group, he's taken the leading role in all the experiments. So he, he's, he's been the man for this. We have some uh, DFT calculations from a collaborator, Orlando uh, Silveira working at Adam Foster's group. And, and the reason we got into this topological superconductivity business in the first place is, is coming from talking with this guy, Temo Oyana. And, and, and so he was involved with Japan in the, the first part of the talk. And then the second part is gonna be about more effect of more potential on topological superconductivity. This is the collaboration with Jose Lado. Jose Lado and his group uh, at Alto University. Okay, so we already heard a couple of talks ago from, from uh, Ron Wiesendange experiments on these atomic scale systems. So we're not going to give you an extensive introduction, but just to show you one slide so that you can you can tune your brain in the in in the right how to say ballpark. So so of course topological superconductivity has been looked at in these nanowire uh, systems very extensively. And I, I mean I'm not an expert in that side. And I've been very very impressed by the let's say the device physics and the materials engineering that goes into the, into the nanowire side. Uh, on the atomic scale, uh, these initial experiments on, on uh, iron chains on lead, self-assembled iron chains on lead, and then later experiments on using the, uh, using the STM tip to, to build these structures atom by atom, like uh, Ronald Wiesendamme was showing, and now the latest results look also extremely exciting. So there's this uh, new stuff also happening here. And, and uh, there's also been work on 2D systems. Um, this uh, also work from the Wiesenberger group, this iron uh, monolayers on, I think this was a rhenium surface. And then also work from Tristan Krenz group where they looked at uh, these kind of uh, pancake structures. So where you have a cobalt, uh, monolayer cobalt island that is buried under a lead, uh, lead monolayer on silicon surface. And, in, in this particular system, in the STM topography, you see nothing. Like you can't, you can't, you just see the top layer of the lead atoms. But then, when you you look at lower density of states, 
at the Fermi energy, then you can see these, these how to say, uh, localized modes that these guys interpret as, as being Majorana modes to go around these, these cobalt atoms, the cobalt ions. Okay, so this, this, this kind of work already exists. And, um, uh, and one more thing about our experimental approach, so we are going to look use uh, low temperature scanning probe microscopy. So all the experiments are ultra high vacuum, of course, low temperatures, and all the sample growth is carried out in the same ultra high vacuum system. So we do everything under ultra high vacuum, the sample never comes out. So only the things we want to put on the surface are, are on the surface. So this is similar to the, uh, to the uh, talk from, from the Wiesent, from uh, Ron Wiesent. And of course with the STM, what we can do is we can look at the atomic scale structure and, and, and then more importantly, we can also look at the atomic scale electronic structure uh, with high energy and, and spatial resolution. So these are the experiments that, these are, this is the experimental tool. Okay, um, uh, so the question is, uh, how are we going to cook up uh, topological superconductivity? And like we already heard from, starting from the first talk from Sankata Sama. Okay, this is the standard recipe. So we take some simple band structure, add Rosberg type spin orbit coupling, add some magnetization and add some S-wave superconductivity. And, and then we get, in principle, we should be able to get uh, topological superconductivity. And in the model, the, the conditions for this are that, first of all, the, the chemical potential has to be tuned inside this, this, this gap opened by the magnetization term. So that's one. So we need control of the chemical potential or we need to be lucky with the chemical potential. And then the second relevant parameter is the magnitude of the topological gap. And, and this is in the units of the parent superconducting gap. Uh, this depends on uh, the magnitude of the spin orbit coupling and the magnitude of the magnetization. So if, if spin orbit is zero, the topological gap is going to be zero. Uh, and, and yeah, well, so it, it, if spin orbit is large, topological gap is going to be large, but of course we need some magnetization as well, because basically uh, if we can tune the chemical potential exactly to this, this right position, then we, we open already for a very small magnetization value, we can open a, a gap in the, or we can, how to say, we can enter the topological regime. But of course, the larger the magnetization, the larger the range in the chemical potential is that we have. have to play. So, and then in these atomic scale systems, we don't have a gate electrode, so, so we, are, we are stuck with the kind of uh, doping we, we have. So, so basically in the end, what we would like is to have a rush bar and magnetization that are roughly, roughly equal order of magnitude. This gives us a reasonable topological gap. And also, how to say, we don't need this super fine, fine tuning of the chemical potential. Okay, so, so what are we going to do? Uh, we are going to use uh, Van der Waals heterostructures to realize the system. So the nice thing about, so of course, Van der Waals heterostructures is a very active field at the moment. And I'm, I think basically the, the main interest in it comes from the fact that there's a large variety of different kinds of Van der Waals materials that have different intrinsic properties. So we have uh, 2D materials that are metals, 2D materials that are ferromagnets, 2D materials that are, are superconducting, and so on. So we can almost arbitrarily combine these in a layer by layer fashion and then bring together uh, these materials with different kinds of electronic properties. And the fact that these layers only interact via the Van der Waals forces means that most likely the materials retain their intrinsic properties. So if I take, well, like in this case, I will take to put together a superconductor and a ferromagnet, they will stay a superconductor and a ferromagnet. And then this is not always so obvious. Uh, for example, like we heard earlier, that if you take a cobalt atom and put it on the surface, then depending on, on what surface and what adsorption side it has, it may or may not be magnetic. But these Van der Waals heterostructures are a little bit, because, because of these weaker interactions, they are a bit, bit more robust for this kind of stuff. Okay, so 
we are going to take, uh, well, the Rush by interactions we get anyway because we have these interfaces. We need uh, a ferromagnet with a perpendicular uh, magnetization direction to the Rush by spin orbit coupling. And uh, we need S for conductor. So these are the, the material ingredients that are going to go in. And then one more note about the sample preparation. So, of course, a very large part of the Van der Waals heterostructure work is, is done using mechanical exfoliation and then this kind of polymer stamp transfer. So you can exfoliate and then make these, these uh, heterostructures mechanically. The problem with that is that the, the effects we are looking at, uh, looking for, are going to happen at the edges of the islands or edges of the layers. And then typically in this kind of uh, mechanical stamp transfer, things involving lithography, you will always end up with some impurities. So it's, it is probably possible to make these interfaces very clean, but the edges of the samples, that is called, that would be very challenging. So instead of, of this kind of exfoliation approach or mechanical assembly, what we are gonna do is we're gonna use molecular beam epitaxy. Uh, which will ensure that we can create very high quality layers that are clean and where the edges are also clean. Okay, so, so first of all, uh, the sub superconductor that we are going to use, uh, this is, uh, there's of course a ho whole bunch of different uh, layered superconductors that we could take, tantalum sulfide, niobium sulfide, niobium selenide, diselenide, sorry. So what we are going to, do is we are going to use a bulk niobium diselenide substrate. Substrate uh, as the bulk niobium diselenide as the substrate. And this has people have studied this with SDM already from the I think when was this paper from 98 from Seamus Davis's group where they show you can very nicely resolve the superconductive gap with, with tunneling spectroscopy and, and you have also this you can see this charge density wave modulation on the surface and so on. Uh, it's a very convenient choice. You can easily prepare it by cleaning it in vacuum. And, and secondly, uh, the bulk substrate has a quite a high uh, critical temperature and a gap. So this, this makes our experiments a little bit easier. And it also has relatively high, high critical field if you need the magnetic field or something. The electronic structure uh, is relatively simple. So for, for the monolayer, you have this single niobium D band that crosses the Fermi level. For, for the bulk, uh, it gets a bit more complicated. There's a couple of bands with this uh, that stem from the niobium D band. Then there's also some selenium derived bands, but it is these niobium D bands that are relevant for the superconductivity. Um, and there's, okay, so, so this is density functional theory calculations. And people have, of course, also looked at the band structure experimentally. This is from my promise group, where you can see in the in the uh, scanning tunnel spectroscopy, you can see the result. Uh, this feature related to the niobium D band, and then this uh, deeper lying state. So you can basically uh, fully resolve the the electronic band structure using using uh, tunnel spectroscopy. Okay, then about the ferromagnet that we need um, now. If this is, of, this is, of course, a very recent development. So a few years ago, monolayer Van der Waals ferromagnets didn't really exist. And, and, and then the field somehow has exploded in the last couple of years, starting by the discovery of ferromagnetism in exfoliated chromium triiodide and, and chromium germanium tellurium. So these exfoliated materials were demonstrated to, to stay ferromagnetic down to monolayer. Um, of course, we want to grow this with MPE, and then initially it, it would have been a problem with these materials. So, uh, but luckily there were several proposals that okay, we can we can take some uh, transition metal dichalkogenides that should should also exhibit ferromagnetism down the monolayer limit. Uh, There's, for example, this work from uh, Hudson's group on vanadium diselenide, and then also work of manganese diselenide. And uh, this was basically the status a couple of years ago when we got started with this. And then, okay, so we also grew vanadium diselenide, but it turns out that uh, vanadium diselenide is not a simple ferromagnet. And, and in the meantime, 
in the last couple of years, there's been several papers discussing uh, the details on, on exactly what kind of magnetic ground state this material has, or whether it in fact is magnetic or not. And then so, so some of these, these transition metal dichal coconuts are, are really not, not sort of not so simple. So they also are not not too con convenient choices for our kind of a designer uh, heterostructure thing. Um, so for example, on vanadium diselenide, you can see that the uh, temperature dependence of these hysteresis loops is very, very small. The saturation magnetization is very large. And then, so this, this does not fit kind of simple ferromagnets. Um, but then, uh, well now, not last year, but the year before, uh, this is, there was this paper from Shibei Woods and Lake Gauss groups uh, from Fudan University, where they demonstrated that actually you can uh, you can prepare chromium tribromide, which is uh, also a ferromagnet down to monolayer limit, by using so-called compound source uh, epitaxis. So basically, just take that material, evaporate it in vacuum onto a substrate, and it grows beautifully. So. Chromium fibromide, they demonstrated, okay, you can make monolayers with this, and then they characterized the magnetization using spin polarized STM and showed that you can, you can uh, get these uh, nice hysteresis loops um, uh, on a, how to say, on a monolayer material. So basically you can use this as an out of plane ferromagnet uh, in the monolayer, which is exactly what we would need for our experiments. Okay, so we then proceeded to grow this. Uh, so first of all, of course, we have to we have to realize the samples. So this is um, we we worked on growing chromium fibromide monolayers on niobium diselenide bulk substrate. So here you see a couple of islands of chromium fibromide. Uh, the pattern you see here is a moiré pattern. So this is related to lattice mismatch between the chromium fibromide and the underlying niobium diselenide. So you get this kind of pair modulation of the, of the registry that gives rise to this uh, more pattern. And this will come important later on in the talk. Uh, and then if you, okay, so you have the more pattern, but then if you zoom in, you can also get atomically resolved images. And then here you see in the STM pictures, you see the, the bromine atoms. So this, this triangles is always the three bromine atoms uh, of, of, the, of the top layer. Uh, the growth is well. It's, it's basically quite simple. So you evaporate from fibromide powder from the Knudsen cell onto a substrate held at about 270 degrees. You can play a little bit with the temperature to, to control the island morphology and the island size. Uh, if you go too low, uh, then instead of getting nice monolayers, you get some kind of disordered clusters. And, and there's also I don't know it might be visible here. Uh, sorry, I have the pictures in front. So, so here you can see this very small region that looks a little bit different. Uh, so about one or two percent of the sample surface looks like this, and this is most likely chromium uh, chromium uh, dibromide. So part of the layer grows like this, but this is a very minor uh, contribution to the to the whole. Okay. So, uh, after realizing the samples, uh, we also characterized it. So we did some uh, magneto-optical Kerr effect experiments. So here you can see this ferromagnetic hysteresis loop, so where you where you start to open the loop at, at around 16 Kelvin. So the Curie temperature on this surface surface is about 16 Kelvin, and, and then when you go down, you open this very nice ferromagnetic uh, uh, hysteresis loop, and it's it's an out of plane. Uh, uh, magnetization direction. TFT calculations say that the uh, magnetic moment per unit cell is about six bore magneton. And then here is a TFT calculation of the chromium tribromide niobium diselenide heterostructure. So what you see is, is the uh, chromium tribromide production band and valence band, and in between are niobium diselenide bands. And if you compare these to the STM experiments, you can see that we detect these sharp onsets of the uh, tunneling conductance at the onset of the chromium fibromide conduction band. And 
signal band, and in between you have some signatures uh, of the niobium disenanide bands that we see through this, this insulating layer. So it's a, it's a ferromagnetic insulator uh, with out of play the magnetization direction and also on this, uh, this niobium disenanide surface. Okay, so let's then focus on the low, low bias spectroscopy. So this is what we are actually interested in. Um, so in principle, we should have all the ingredients that you need uh, for realizing topological superconductivity. So now let's first take a, a spectrum of the niobium disenanide substrate here, the blue spectrum. And, and here you can see uh, the spectrum and, and you can see uh, this is a fit to, to a model. So this niobium diselenide is a, is a two gap superconductor. So these, these coherence peaks are not as sharp as in, um, if you had just a, how to say, a single gap structure, but it, this is a well-known effect. So, so we can very, can very accurately also reproduce the, the uh, measured LDOS uh, with, with the simple fit. Okay, then you go and do the same experiment on the chromium trichromide monolayer. So you are probing the niobium disenanide states under this uh, ferromagnetic layer. And what you can see is that inside the, the superconducting gap, there is some extra stuff. There's not too much, but you can clearly notice that there is extra signal compared to the uh, uh, substrate, bare substrate. And now if I, if I subtract uh, this, this fit from the experiment, then you can somehow quantify more easily this, this extra stuff. So we have these, these extra bands inside the uh, superconducting gap. And the idea is that these are the, the UC Barusina bands that are formed because of the interaction of, between the magnet and the underlying super. And in between these bands, there's a gap. And now if, if this is in the topological regime, then this is the, this is the topological gap that we are, we are seeing here. And now I, will, I hope I will, in the next few slides, show you that this, is, this should indeed be seen as, as the topological gap. Okay, so if it's a topological superconductor, then of course at the edges of the of the sample we should see edge modes, and and, and so this edge here means the edge the, the edge of the chromium trichromide island, and then so where we go from the what we we think is a topological superconducting state under the magnetized island, and and the trivial superconductor outside the magnetized island, and if you take a spectrum exactly at the, at the interface. You can see this huge uh, zero bias conductance feature. You can see that it, it spans, so it, it's, not, it's not very sharp. And, and it spans basically this, this gap uh, between these Shiva bands in, inside the superconductor. And of course, this is, a, it's a, this is supposed to be a 2D topological superconductor. So then these, these edge modes are, are 1D modes going around these islands. So they, it's, in, it's a band of edge states. So it's, it, how to say, the fact that it spans the whole topological gap is, is not surprising. Okay, we can of course then also do localized spectroscopy and map out how, where is this, this uh, guy living. And you can see that, that the mode is very localized only on the edges of this, uh, this chromium fragment. All right. Um, now, if it's, a, if it's a topological superconductor, uh, then it should not matter too much, like what is the detailed structure of the island edge, or what is the orientation of the island edges with respect to the substrate and so on. Uh, you should always have these edge modes. And this is indeed what we see. So on all the chromium trichromide islands that we've looked at, you always have these edge modes. Uh, at zero bias. So here is a, a, a collection of ex examples, and then you can see that that these edge, these zero bias features, are always found at the edges of the islands. Now we've done some some, let's say, uh, simple checks on 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 ruling out some trivial effects. So first of all, we can. Uh, it could be somehow that these these. Um, that we have some trivial edge modes associated with the fact that we have grown these islands on the, on the niobium diselenide. Now, if we 
uh, quench the superconductivity by using an external field, then if these edge modes were, were just some normal edge states, they, they should still remain. Well, this is not the case. So if, if we use an external field to quench the superconductivity of the, of the low gas substrate, then first of all, well, of course, you kill the superconducting gap, but you also completely kill these edge modes. So there is nothing, nothing visible. The density of states is completely flat. Th this also uh, rules out the possibility that these edge states, all these, these uh, states that we see would be somehow related to condo, uh, condo states. So you could argue that, that these edges of the magnetic island have some free spins that then would, would make um, a condo state with the, with the substrate. Uh, but this should also be visible once we've removed the superconductivity, but so this is also not the, not the explanation for what we see. Okay, um, to go into a bit more detail about this, um, let's spend a, a minute to think about, so what kind of topological superconductor is do you think we have realized? So, of course, on the first one of the first slides, I saw this this uh, usual picture where you take just a simple parabolic band. Diamond diselenide is okay. It's a triangular lattice, so the band structure looks a little bit different. So here is a uh, here is a simple model of the niobium D band for a niobium diselenide monolayer in the presence of of the rush bar and the magnetization terms, and then now. Uh, the theory tells us that in principle, by tuning the, the chemical potential to different, uh, how to say, uh, different energies, we can realize, we could in principle realize different topological superconducting states in the system. So if we tune it here in the endpoint, uh, we would get a, a, a topological superconductor with a churn number three. If we go to the uh, gamma point, we've realized uh, churn number one, minus one rather. And then if you tune it to the K point, we would realize uh, churn number two. And now the question is that, okay, so what do we have in the experiment? And then of course the Fermi energy in our system is wherever it is. And then so uh, it's not, not like we, are, we, we, we would not be able to tune it over this whole band. Uh, this calculation is for a monolayer nine root diselenide. It's actually not that easy to say exactly where the bands are uh, with respect to the thermal level in, in the bulk. Um, the best estimate is that the, the endpoint is closest to the thermal level and it's somewhat below thermal level. So now what we need is that the magnetization induced uh, gap here so that we would how say we need to we would need to hit this gap with the with the thermal level. Um, and one thing we can do is we can see what happens to the band, band positions or the band offsets uh, when we go from the clean niobium diselenide onto the chromium trabromide uh, monolayer covered area. And what you can see is that when I go from the clean niobium diselenide, so this point spectroscopy with the SDN uh, crossing the island edge, you can see that all the bands shift up about by about 80 millivolts. So, so all the bands shift up a little bit which means that this endpoint should be tuned closer to the closer to the thermal level. So the conclusion is that this is the most likely, uh, how to say, uh, origin of the of the topological superconductivity. So. Okay, so Temu uh, and Chevron did a, a little bit more detailed theory calculation. So they took uh, a reasonable tight mining model for the for niobium diselenide and then made real space calculations with a kind of a magnetic island. Um, and then we can compare what comes out in theory versus the experiment. So uh, there's a few things that are not kind of super obvious. So let me just point those out. Uh, so first of all, these edge modes in the experiment are quite narrow. They have a, the, the width is about two and a half nanometers. And then this comes out naturally from the from the theory without putting any unreasonable parameters so this is uh, this is what you get uh, the second thing is that this 
uh, this specific form on how exactly this local density of states looks like, that we get this peak-shaped LDOS. That's also reproduced by the theory without uh, fine-tuning. Uh, there are some more refined things. Now, if I look at here, the energy, uh, these LDOS maps as a function of energy. So at, at zero bias, we only see the edge states. When I come a little bit higher here, we are at the edge of the Shiba bands, so the inside of the uh, of the island starts to light up a little bit as well. And then here you can see more intensity, but you can still see the edge, edges as well. So this kind of coexistence between the edge states and the Shiba bands of higher energies, uh, this is also comes out of the, the theory calculus. And then finally, this kind of, if you look at the, the uh, edge mode, LDOS, so whenever there is a very sharp corner of the island, you can see that the LDOS is suppressed. So this is also something that, that um, so whenever you have a sharp enough corner in the magnetic island, the LDOS gets suppressed, and this also comes out of the, of the theory calculation. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this is maybe for the experts in the audience. Uh, in niobium diselenide, there's also another kind of a spin orbit interaction. Uh, so this is uh, due to the broken inversion symmetry, you get this icing spin orbit interaction. And, and if you put this into theory, uh, then it's extremely detrimental to topological superconductivity. So basically, even a little bit of icing immediately drives the system into a, uh, into a gapless state. So into a gapless state, which is of course not, not consistent with our our observations. So, so for some reason, the easing does not seem to be uh, important. And, and the suggestion is that this has to do with the with the Nyobin charge density phase. And I, I will come back to this uh, in a couple of slides time. But so you know, there, there is a there's a reason why why the easing might not kill us in, in this system. Okay, so a few things to discuss. Uh, so I think a typical picture is that, okay, so we have these, these edge modes, uh, they have some kind of linear dispersion or close to linear at least. So this is a calculation for the Niobu diselenide system uh, in a linear strip geometry. And you can see these, these, uh, these red, red guys are the edge modes. Uh, okay, so if these are roughly linear at Fermi energy, then it means that they have constant density of states. And, and yet I showed you the, I showed you a, a peak-shaped uh, uh, spectrosol. So, does this make sense, or, or do we somehow? Is there a disagreement? And in fact, there's no disagreement. So, uh, the fact that you have a constant dos does not mean that you would have to have constant L dos. So, this is really it's important to remember what we are measuring with the SDN. We are really measuring the local density of states, and, and then you can understand that. Uh, this is not going to give, let not necessarily, it doesn't have to be a constant, it can be peak shaped. Um, but the second thing to, to maybe stop to think about for a second is that, uh, okay, so I showed you that many things match kind of naturally between theory and experiment. So is there something that doesn't match? And I think there are two main things that, that are somehow a little bit off. Uh, first, if you look in detail, uh, these edge modes. So, okay, I explained that these, these sharp corners around the magnetic islands give you suppression of the LDOS. That's fine. But also, if you look at on these very, very flat edges, you can see that the edge mode is not completely, the, the, the LDOS is modulated. And, and it seems that there's some preferred period, that it's not just randomly changing, but it's modulated with some, some uh, how to say, some well-defined uh, spatial period. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is that I, I argued that, okay, uh, we don't know exactly where the bands are with respect to thermal level, but somehow the M, M point is the closest, so we are probably hitting there. So it, it's kind of a fair question to ask, is this some kind of a cosmic coincidence that we just magically have the right chemical potential? Uh, or is there something more, more to it? And, and what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk arguing is that, in fact, these both, both of these things uh, are naturally explained if you include the effect of the Mora pattern that we have uh, in, this, in the theory picture. Now, um, 
So this is uh, the theory part is, is work from uh, Hoselar. Um, I don't know, I, I don't think there is a, a theory paper on, on basically 2D topological superconductors with more potentials, but you could of course say that, well, it's basically just a periodic modulation. And then here's a selection of, this is not an exhaustive list of, of, of papers where people have considered what is an effect if you have a periodic potential on 1D systems, uh, but also there is some work on, on 2D, uh, 2D systems. So what, what would you get uh, from, uh, from this periodic uh, potential? So, um, okay, so there's some, some earlier work on this, uh, but let's, uh, let's now go through this. Um, in, what exactly do you get in, in the case of uh, these 2D materials with, with the more potential? So first of all, the Mora pattern, it's, it's um, like I said, it's caused by different lattice constants, or, or of course, you could also get it from the misalignment of the lattices, so all this twisting, twistronic stuff. Uh, so basically what you get is a periodic variation of the atomic register. So here's a simple, very simple uh, ball and stick 1D model that where you have two layers with different lattice constants, then the exact position where the blue atoms are with respect to the red atoms, varies in space in a, in a periodic way. Okay, so what does it, what's the effect? So here is the, for a 1D system, here is the original band structure. You have this, uh, well, 1D type binding cosine band. And now if I turn on the water potential, uh, then what happens is that the prion zone gets smaller. How to say that the real space period gets larger, the prion zone gets smaller. Uh, uh, we fold up this original band structure into this uh, more brion zone. And also if there's some, some interaction between these, um, uh, then what, you, what happens is you open gaps in the band structure. So this is the simple sort of very, the simplest picture of what happens uh, with more potentials. Now, what does it mean for topological superconductivity? And, and of course, uh, we could think about, uh, so what, what exactly is modulated in, in a system, in, in, a, in a picture of a superconductor and a magnet on top of it, uh, if we have a more red. So of course, what gets modulated is the, uh, basically the on-site energy, so the electrostatic potential, uh, the exchange coupling uh, is likely to get strongly modulated. This will have an effect on superconducting pair, pairing and so on. So, so there's a bunch of things that get modulated. In theory, we can, of course, turn these on and off one by one. And it turns out that it doesn't really matter. All of these effect, all of these modulations give rise to similar, similar picture. OK, so here's the original band structure for a 1D topological superconductor. Uh, and now if we, we put on the Moray, then what happens is that in, without the Moray, you can only realize the topological phase at this band extreme. So here you have these pseudo helical states, uh, which will give you the topological superconductor. So then in, in between there's no topological phases. And then when the chemical potential is at the band bottom, then you can again enter the topological phase. Now, if you have a more potential and then this band folding, then it turns out that there are much more regions of chemical potential where it's possible to enter the topological uh, phase. So basically we, we and then most prominently, so around this zero energy where there was no topological phase without the more potential, potential suddenly we have uh, green areas uh, in there. So I can, I can uh, pre represent this, this in, a, in a different kind of a plot where we have the chemical potential on the x-axis and the more modulation of strength on the y-axis. So when we turn on the more modulation, then we create these additional regions uh, in the phase diagram, uh, which are topological. Okay, um, then I have one major slide, but let me just go, to, go through it briefly. So, so, okay, so this was a 1D model. Now, what, how would this look like in a niobium diselenide? So, uh, this is a, a tight binding band structure of niobium diselenide with e spin-orbit interaction. 
And remember earlier on, I said that easing kills your top ownership of base. Uh, okay, then if I put in exchange and Raspa and superconductivity, we end up in this, this, this mess. Um, and I mean, okay, these, the, mag the magnitudes of the parameters are reasonable. Of course, you can, you can play with them, but this would be the sort of typical result. And then, by the way, note that these, these two left mode span structures, these are large energies, so this is in the units of the hopping, whereas the last one is zoomed into the superconducting uh, energy scale. So what you see, the system is gapless. And, and this is precisely what I was saying earlier, that if you put in easing, then this uh, turns the system uh, gapless. Now, however, uh, in niobium diselenide, we have this charge density wave state. So we have this three by three modulation. And it turns out that if you include this in the model, uh, it gaps out certain uh, parts of the Brion zone. So here we have the matching panels with charge density wave modulation. So here you can see that we have gapped regions around the K point. And it turns out that this uh, removes the detrimental effect of the easing easing spin on it. And so then we can, this is now a topological superconducting state. And then if you look back in the, what, so how does this band structure look like with all the effects? Uh, it in fact looks very much like a, a simple triangular lattice at half fit. So, so basically then the simplest effective model for, for niobium diselenide with everything would be this, this, um, uh, this simple triangular lattice at half. So the, here is the, here's the band structure for that uh, with uh, magnetization and brush bar. And then if you look at the topological phase diagram, you can see that around zero, uh, so charge neutrality, there are no topological phases. Um, so, but, what happens when you turn on the more modulation is, is like in, I argued in the 1D case, you, you create these topological regions in the base space. And, and specifically, this is now a zoom in close to the charge neutrality. And you can see that when the more modulation strength is ramped up, uh, you suddenly hit topological range without any fine tuning of the chemical condition at all. So this is likely what's, what's, got, what's actually happening in our case. Now, uh, how do we confirm that we have this, this kind of more modulation in the system? Okay, there's a few things we can look at. Uh, this is now large bias range uh, spectroscopy. And um, uh, basically, as I go over the more pattern, you can see that the, the conduction band onset is modulated with the more period. And then this is, uh, this is uh, the onside, this would be the onside energy modulation that says roughly 50 millivolts. So this is one effect. And then the second effect is that, um, yeah, let me keep this moving. The second effect is that the, the Yushiba Rusinov uh, bands get modulated. So we have this modulation of the on-site energies, and we are also going to have a modulation of the exchange coupling because we have this variation in the local stacking. And then this should give a modulation of the Yushiba Rusinov uh, bands. And then what you can see here is that if I'm at the coherence peak, so panel C here, you see basically nothing in the DIDV map. Then when I tune the energy to the energy, energies corresponding to the Yushima Rusina bands, you see nicely the more pattern coming, coming through in the local density of states. And then when I go inside the gap, how to say at zero, again, there's no, no modulation. And this is now the amplitude. So the amplitude of the Yushiba Rusinov bands gets modulated. But if we do, um, how to say, if we analyze what is the energy of this, let's say the band center, then this does not get modulated uh, uh, basically at all. And this is, uh, this is also what comes out of the theory. So if you take a theory calculation, you put in a, a modulation of the exchange uh, coupling, and then you look at the resulting LDOS, then outside the superconducting gap, you have very small modulation. And when you go to the UC Barusin of band, bands, you see this very clear modulation uh, like we see in the experiment. 
Okay, uh, the more red uh, modulation is also visible at the edges. So here is now a, a couple of sets of experimental data. So first an STM topograph where you can see the more pattern. I've just overlaid the, the triangular lattice so you can keep track of where, where things are. Now, if I go to the energies corresponding to Shiba bands, then you can see that there is the same modulation as I showed you on the last slide. Now here, the spatial resolution is a little bit worse, so it doesn't look as pretty, but it's still there. Uh, at these energies, there is, you see this slight extra intensity at the edges, but there's not nothing too much there. But then when you go zero bias, then you see, okay, we have nothing in the bulk and you just see this modulated uh, edge state intensity. And then the period here matches very nicely the more red period. Okay. And then if we do the simple model, the simplest possible model, this kind of effects come out quite naturally from that. All right. So, a uh, couple of last slides. Um, so first of all, okay, so we are here. What, what to do next? So there are a couple of obvious things, things to do. So, so okay, we, we realize these topological edge modes at the edges of these chromium trichromide islands. And um, uh, there's always some charge transfer between the chromium trichromide and the naive gasoline substrate. So somehow the edges are, are not, the, I mean, they are nice, they're clean, but they are not the cleanest possible experiment. It would be much nicer if you could have a, a magnetic domain wall in the bulk of the system. And it turns out this is so, this is a, obviously a schematic. So if you had a magnetic domain wall uh, between two different magnetization directions, then you would expect these Majorana modes uh, at, the, at the domain wall. And it turns out that you can realize such domain walls. So this is a very recent paper uh, from um, your Bachtracht groups, uh, groups group where they, they image, not atomic resolution imaging, but uh, uh, well, nanoscale imaging that this, when you have, when you tune the magnetization, when, oh, sorry, when you tune the external magnetic field, then you can create this kind of magnetization uh, domain patterns in chromium tracker. So now if we did this on our experiment, we should be able to look at these, these edges or these, these uh, interfaces between two different uh, magnetization domain. So this is, I think, something that is on the on the to-do list. Uh, we can, of course, also play with the materials. Uh, in principle, that's easy. These Van der Waals materials are, are it's a very flexible platform. So that's somehow that's a really the, the strong point. We can, with relative ease, change from one material to the other. Uh, and and for example, if we use monolayer materials, then we might be able to use. Uh, Electrostatic doping, so gating to tune the Fermi level at least a little bit. So this is something certainly worthwhile uh, thinking about. Uh, and then one one thing that's kind of an open question to me, at least, is that okay? So we've heard that you can do spin polarized STM, and, and there is a well, there, there are things that you should see with with if you have a only topological superconductor with zero D minorunners, then you should see certain signatures. Uh, I'm not quite sure if if there is a prediction or if there's a calculation or suggestion what you should see for these one D Meyer modes. Yeah, so it's not very clear to me. But if if there is a certain uh, well-defined suggestion what should happen with spin polarized STM, then this is obviously a, this would be a nice experiment. Um, okay, so that brings to my me to my conclusions. So okay, I, I discussed our experiments on Van der Waals. Uh, Heterostructures, where we've realized uh, this, this topological superconductivity and, and looked at the edge modes that result. Uh, and then I uh, argued that this more rare pattern is, is actually helpful. You get more, more, more say, regions in the phase diagram with, with the topological, more regions of the topological phase in the, in the phase diagram if you have these more rare modulations. And, and you can see the references there. So the first paper was out in, in Nature late last year. And the other, other part of the talk is you can find it on the arc. And, and as an outlook, I think there are a few things. So this, this 1D Majorana modes 
in Vandervaal's heterostructures. Vandervaal's heterostructures, people have spent a lot of effort on developing how to make devices out of this. So, so this is clearly one thing that, that would be very exciting. Uh, and then ultimately the question is, okay, what can we actually do with this one in my runners? And, and then the, the, maybe the other take home message is that these very big potentials, okay, I showed it for this one, the valve center structure, but in, the effects should work. I mean, the, the same physical picture should work for, for other systems as well. So maybe there's something in the nano wire business that where this would be also helpful, but that's not my speciality. But with that, I'm, I'm done. So thanks a lot for your attention. And, and if you have some questions, please let me know. Thank you, Peter, for an excellent talk. And now it's open to questions. Shankar, do you want to ask questions? Yeah, I'll again wait for others, and then I'll ask the final questions. So, yeah, of course, I have some questions. Yes, absolutely. Uh, then maybe, maybe I, I can ask the first question. Uh, yeah, Peter, uh, so I have a question about the uh, AG state you saw in the experiment because uh, I think those uh, materials are uh, with the trend number, so that means you have a chiral AG state. However, in the presence of Murray potential, uh, you show this uh, interest in oscillation. And uh, I have a hard time to try to understand what is this. Uh, because if I look at just at your, 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 your plot here, it looks like there are a lot of uh, small quasi bounce state or something, and they they become the uh, edge state as a whole. Uh, but uh, that's sort of a contradict to my understanding about the carrier edge state because a carrier edge is only going to one way. Then there's no bad scattering, etc. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. So I don't think they are bounce state. So so and the modulation it's somehow not that 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 the edge state is broken. It's just the intensity is modulated. The local density of states is modulated. So for example, you can see here, spectrum taking at the highest intensity point where we see a very prominent peak in that zero bias. And then there's another spectrum taken on something that looks on this color scale blue, but you can still see that there's still signal at zero. So it's not that, that we don't somehow go from zero to something, but it's just that there's a modulation. I see. So I suspect this must be the velocity fluctuation on the edge. Okay, yeah, thank you. And uh, now, uh, if there is any other question. Can I ask a, like a, a, a small question? Uh, so uh, Peter, it's a, it's a really great talk. And I'm just wondering if it's possible to do, to apply a vertical magnet, out of the magnet field to see if the if the vortex can bind some around a bounce state, because you know, this appears to be a P plus IP superconductor race. Yeah, yeah. So, well, we have of course looked at that. Uh, uh, you can, yeah, I don't, I don't have the slide with me. You can see some, some data on vortices. Let me see if I can pull the reference out for you. Uh, sorry, just a sec. Yeah, uh, no, no, this one. So this, yeah, this one. So it's on the archive. Uh, so there we show some spectra on, on, over vortices. And, and it turns out that the energy resolution is, is so, I mean, we see these core states, but we can't distinguish between what you would expect for trivial and what you would expect for topological. So the energy resolution is not, not good enough. I see, I see. Uh, and another very simple question is, uh, is it possible for, uh, for us to, uh, uh, because now you, you, using STM, we just see that there is a low bias peak theory, right? Uh, mm -hmm. is it, are there like an additional approach to, to actually figure out the correlity of the, of the edge mode? Uh, you, for example, use internal spectroscopy. For example, can we can we actually extract some like uh, the, the the velocity for this edge mode, something like that, just to make sure that you are actually chiral. But because if we have like something like a flat band, my run a flat band around the edge, we, we can see a similar zero bias peak in this way. This is why I'm asking. About yeah. This so, so okay. So uh, I mean, in principle, uh, we should be able to to look at the let's say the detailed. L does as a function of energy and position. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I have a minor, if I have a band, then the the decay length should vary uh, as I go closer and closer to the gap edge. Uh, but I think the experimental problem is that they are, these guys are quite localized. So, so everything happens over this this couple of nanometers. So, so there's not too much not too much to see there. But this is something that we should look in more detail still. I think. Thank thank you. Jay, 
Yeah, so I have so, um, so I guess uh, the Moire, so I'm trying to understand the role of the Moire pattern or the Moire in creating this uh, topological state better. I guess it has to be important because niobium diselenide has a rather large Fermi energy, right? So the, to the, at least from the usual recipe for combining the three in, the ingredients, the spin orbit, uh, Zeeman and chemical potential, the chemical potential condition would typically be hard to match. Um, unless the Zeeman effective Zeeman, uh, I guess is, is very large. So do, do you have some insight on this? Well, I, I, if I understand this theory correctly, then I mean, you just need to, to hit one of the high, high symmetry points uh, with the chemical potential. So the, the whole bandwidth is about one electron volt. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of different high energy, high, uh, high, oh, sorry, so high symmetry points. So we should just be able to tune mm -hmm. to one of these. Yes. And then the magnetization energy, I mean, we don't know this exactly. Uh, I think typical estimate is, is a few tens of milli EV. Mm -hmm. So this is what you, this exchange coupling between uh, in these right. DMD systems is typical something like this. Mm -hmm. So, but, but if I look at your band structure, the Fermi energy at, the, at any of these high symmetry points yeah. is quite high, right? Yeah, okay. But th this is a calculation for monolayer 19 diselenide. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not exactly reality. But I, I mean, this was one of the things we were also wondering that were we just super lucky somehow that, that we are in the right spot. But it, uh, it seems that right. we, because you fold the bands in with the more potential, yes. then you open up these gaps. Yeah, okay, that's so that right. Okay, good. So that's what I wanted to confirm. So you, you believe that the Moire pattern has a crucial role. I, in, I think it's a, it's a more natural, so natural explanation. Okay. And, but then the, any disorder in the, like uh, alignment disorder in the Moire would, would be, a, would play a role also probably, right? Well, I, I, I mean, if you alter the Moire, then you will alter the, the, how to say where the gaps exactly are. Yeah. Uh, we don't have too much disorder. So, so okay. if you go, I mean, but by this disorder, I mean, the, the, the two lattices are trying to lock uh presumably in in some some way and at least in i guess in, in twisted bilayography you get this twist angle kind of disorder yeah but they're of um, course the, from from that yeah the, the angle is very very small so i i think you can see here see. uh so what what you can see is that the more uh, if, if you look at the sort of direction of the more ray changes a little bit but this mm. is of course but the period doesn't change too much so this i think one of these mm. is Roughly exactly aligned, and the other one is is then zero point one or two degrees off that that rotates the moving pattern. I see. Okay. But it, it's not. It is not somehow. I mean, of course, if we did this mechanically, then we could tune the more uh, orientation. Mm. This is uh, what what do you get from the growth? Uh -huh. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, no, I think Shankar. Yeah, so yeah, so actually my question be, just became much shorter because JD passed 80% of it. Uh, this more thing I like very much and I understand how it possibly provides an explanation for the, you know, providing a topological condition. But I have this like, you know, more basically is not a crystal, right? Because it's, it's quasi-periodic, it's not periodic, meaning, meaning it's periodic only up to some length scale. By definition, if you take two crystals, and mm -hmm. you don't get a periodic structure. It doesn't matter what you're seeing in Fourier space. So there is always some disorder inherent in it because you are, I mean, you wrote several papers on it. We're writing another one that uh, it's always a, a, a periodic plus some disorder. That's, it's essentially a rational approximation, a Diophantine approximation to an irrational. And you always have something left. And what is left is the disorder. It's, you know, it's a very mathematical point. Now, we, for example, believe that that's what is causing in twisted bilayer graphene, why no two samples show exactly the same behavior, although they show similar behavior, you know. And I wonder if that sort of disorder would be important here, but I think you answered the question that here the angles are somewhat larger and any disorder like that is likely to be smaller. Yeah, I, 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 I think I can only say sort of two comments to that. So one, if you look at 
microscopic images of the twisted bilayer, then they clearly have more disorder yes. somehow than yes. we do. Yes. And then the second thing is that that so okay in this sample we only see this slight variation in the more angle, but this does not seem to have an effect on the edge states. We yeah. see them everywhere. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's a that's a plausible explanation. I mean, whether that's going on or not, who knows? But zero thought that sounds like a reasonable explanation. I'll think more about it. But uh, yeah, I accept the answer. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. Thank you. Okay, I think we should move to the next talk. And thanks, thanks Peter again for a wonderful talk. And uh, uh, Professor uh, Senescu, uh, maybe you can start to share your screen. Okay, we can see your screen. Okay, okay. let me give a short introduction now. Um, our next speaker is Professor Stonescu from University of uh, West Virginia. Uh, Professor uh, Stonescu was actually a CNTC postdoc uh, some time ago. Uh, his uh, theory is working on topological quantum matter, quantum information, and uh, he actually wrote a book on this. To be, today, he's going to tell us about how far away is the Marijuana Zero Mode landmarks in the desert of disorder. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to thank Shankar for organizing this wonderful conference and for inviting me to uh, talk about this work. Uh, it will be mainly, mainly about uh, semiconductor, superconductor hybrid structures, but perhaps some of the general ideas uh, will be relevant for other platforms as well. Um, so as, as it was mentioned earlier today, uh, the Marana zero mode came into the world as a theoretical proposal. And as always with the theoretical proposals, there should be a disclaimer regarding uh, the feasibility of this proposal. Now we, we, we can see what can go wrong with it, even from the toy model, the one dimensional toy model. So in this case, uh, we have three critical ingredients the spin orbit coupling, the Zeeman splitting, and the superconductivity. But we also uh, need to meet certain conditions. So for example, just by looking at, at this spectrum, one can see that the length of the system has to be large enough. Uh, otherwise, the Majoranas that will form there will overlap and basically the, the mode will, will get gapped. Uh, another conditions, condition that, that we can see is this condition for the topological phase to occur. Uh, in terms of the chemical potential, one can uh, view uh, the requirement for tuning the chemical potential close enough to the bottom of the band, because on the other hand, the Zeeman splitting Vx cannot be arbitrarily large because applying a too large magnetic field will completely destroy superconductivity. Uh, now this condition becomes more complicated if we deal with multiband systems, uh, but I will not uh, go into details. Now the, the most important implicit condition that it's, it's uh, a, behind this, this equation is that all the parameters are position independent. In other words, all these parameters are uniform enough uh, as a function of the position along the wire. And here we, we, we have this issue of disorder, of non-uniformity in general. Uh, now, if we go to real systems, the situation is even more complicated. First of all, let me, let me emphasize that the systems involved in this uh, 
type of experiments have a huge parameter space. So there are control parameters that like the ma magnetic field, various gate voltages, temperature, and so on. Then there are system parameters that uh, are related to the geometry of the system, like length of the wire, diameter, uh, uh, shape of the uh, semiconductor, superconductor interface, and so on. And then, of course, a, a bunch of materials parameter like effective mass, spin orbit coupling, G factor, and so on. In addition, if we uh, assume that non uniformity is a reality, then we have uh, many parameters that would be associated with these non uniformity. And in general, in this talk, I, I, I will refer to this non uniformity as disorder, but of course, uh, in, in certain cases, it is due to uh, variations like of the effective potential near the end of the wire due to applied gate voltages, for example. Typically, uh, these parameters will involve some, some amplitudes and some relevant length scales, and there can be many of those. So this is a huge parameter space. Uh, what we know is that, uh, if disorder or non-uniformity more generally is negligible, there should be a topological phase. So in other words, if we uh, simply uh, condense the, all these, sorry, uh, these uh, uh, disorder degrees of freedom in one axis and all the other con control and system parameters along the other axis, there should be uh, a domain of low enough disorder where uh, topological phases in Majorana physics takes place. The question now, the crucial question at this stage is where in this, in this uh, phase diagram we are with the systems available. Uh, I think that early on, a few years ago, the hope was that we are somewhere along here and by just moving up and down along this control and system parameter axis, one can reach the, what I call my Rana C. But in the past few years, I think uh, there is more evidence that we might be to the right of this my Rana C, somewhere here in what I call the desert of disorder. So the crucial, the crucial question now is where, how far, how deep in this desert of disorder are we? And how can we move towards the, the Marana Sea? Uh, in this context, I believe there are two critical tasks. The first one is to identify the main sources of disorder or non-homogeneity and characterize them carefully, quantitatively. Uh, the, second, the second point would be uh, that we need to, to, to describe in detail the low energy phenomenology of the system in the presence of disorder. Uh, and in this context, there is an important point about methodology. Uh, and this is important because this tells us how to navigate through this desert of disorder. And uh, I will give some, some answer right away. And I would suggest that the way to, to figure out where we are in this, in, in, in this large parameter space is to provide both theoretically and experimentally large area surveys. In other words, to generate de details, detailed map over large uh, windows in, in, in parameter space. Um, and if possible to, to provide uh, uh, this type of maps for more than one nominally identical systems with no data selection, in other words. Uh, before I, I, I go into the more technical uh, part, let me give you an example what I mean by these maps. And I, Consider a simple example, the maps uh, that give the lowest energy of the system 
in terms of two control parameters, the chemical potential uh, and the Zeeman field. And these are two examples for, uh, for clean systems, so no disorder. And the first system has, uh, both systems have the same, uh, I mean, have two bands, but in the case of the first system, the interband spacing is large, and we are looking within a window that's close to one of the bands. In the second case, the interband spacing is relatively small, and within the new window that we focus on, we have both bands. So uh, here you can uh, clearly see the basically the, the region with very low uh, quasi-particles. This deep blue region is uh, uh, a signature of, of quasi-particles that have energies lower than uh, 10 micro EV. Um, and basically this coincides with the topological superconducting region. Okay. In the case of the, uh, uh, the small intergap system, uh, these two regions associated with, uh, uh, with, with the two bands overlap uh, partially. Now, what happens with this type of phase diagrams in the presence of disorder? So we consider a specific disorder realization, it's, it's potential disorder, and this shows the, the, the dependence of the effective potential on the position along the wire. This is a two micron wire, by the way. And uh, for, this, uh, uh, for this disorder realization, the first thing that one can see is that, okay, the, the phase boundaries are affected a little bit, but not too much. Uh, and some low energy states occur outside the nominally topological region in, in this region of, of higher uh, chemical potential. Uh, the effect is stronger in the case in, in, in this second system. Okay. Um, now, if we continue to increase the amplitude of the disorder, so the disorder profile will be the same, but now the amplitude is 2.5 times stronger. You can see that, first of all, the, the shape of the, of the topological region is lost. So it, it, it doesn't resemble any more the, the parabolic shape that it's characteristic or, or the, the triangular shape that's characteristic to the clean system. Uh, this is particularly, uh, obvious in, in, in this second system with two nearby uh, bands, okay? If we continue to increase disorder, this situation, it's, it's, it's even more, more uh, uh, pronounced. Notice here, for example, that, that the occurrence of low energy modes uh, in the system, uh, it's characterized by a field that it's almost independent on the, on the value of the chemical potential. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what you notice is that these deep blue regions become more fragmented at, at large disorder. So these become like small islands uh, rather than large regions like in this, in the clean case. Okay, so uh, to gain uh, a little bit further insight, let's take a few, uh, uh, a few cuts through the phase diagrams. So uh, in, in this case, uh, the chemical potential is varied along these lines. As expected for the clean system, one can nicely see the closing of the uh, bulk gap at this point, and then the Majorana mode in the topological region, and then the reopening of the gap uh, in the trivial region at high chemical potential. Similarly, in the, in the second case, we have uh, uh, basically two crossings of the topological region with the corresponding Majorana modes at zero, near zero energy. Now, what happens in the presence of disorder? Well, in the presence of disorder, first of all, this, the, the, the spectrum becomes practically gapless. 
uh, one can one can notice this type of linearly dispersing modes like this one here this would give this feature that you can see on the map okay these are uh, trivial Andreev bound states uh, that occur in 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 the system uh, you can see them here and you can see them in 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 the other in the other uh, system as well uh, however even in this in this situation there are some some remnants of Majorana physics like uh, this mode here that tends to stick near zero as well as similar modes in these in these uh, regions that were emphasized uh, in addition there are, there are other regions out, outside the nominally uh, topological regime where there are modes that try to kind of uh, stay near zero energy now this one, for example, it's a remnant Majorana mode uh, that of course it's, it's protected by a puny gap. However, I would uh, uh, emphasize that this still contains Majorana physics. So uh, in particular, for example, if you remove one of the uh, key ingredients like spin orbit coupling, you would get a, a, a spectrum that it's completely different from uh, this one. So uh, even in this uh, intermediate uh, disorder regime, there is some Marana physics going on. I would call this a Marana oasis uh, in this desert of disorder. So now uh, let me switch and, and discuss the first task that, that I mentioned earlier. So basically, uh, we need to, to characterize different types of disorder quantitatively. And here I give an example. The details can be found in this, in this preprint. Uh, so uh, we consider charge impurities that are embedded into a, a semiconductor, superconductor structure. And uh, the system consists of, of course, in, in, in a, a semiconductor nanowire uh, that it's partially uh, covered to, uh, by a superconducting layer. And also uh, it, it, there is a metallic gate that allows one to, to tune the chemical potential. And uh, our first goal is to understand the effect of a charge impurity that it's embedded somewhere inside this wire. To uh, address this, this problem, one has to solve actually a Schrodinger Poisson problem. And we do that uh, for uh, the Hamiltonian that we use at this stage. It's a simplified Hamiltonian uh, that does not include uh, lower energy contributions such as such as uh, for example the the Zeeman splitting or the spin orbit coupling uh, but in uh, includes the the dominant contribution coming from electrostatics for example uh, this this electrostatic potential is uh, obtained by solving a Poisson, uh, Poisson problem with some uh, charge distribution uh, density that contains rho naught, which is the free charge in the wire. So that would be the free charge in a clean wire. Then there is the contribution from the impurity itself. And then there is a contribution from the redistribution of the charge density inside the wire due to the presence of the impurity. And of course, uh, the sum of these two terms uh, it's related to the wave functions of uh, that that of the states in the in the semiconductor wire. So these two equations are coupled and have to be solved self-consistently. Um, I will not uh, go into the the technical details. I will just say that that the the uh, main uh, objects that we are trying to calculate are 
these effective uh, uh, impurity potentials, which basically are uh, matrix elements of, of the pot uh, potential that includes contribution from the impurity and the redistributed charges with these uh, wave function corresponding to the transverse modes that uh, uh, are present in the wire. So such a V alpha beta can be understood as basically matrix element at a certain uh, position Z uh, of uh, along the wire of uh, basically the impurity potential, including the redistribution of the free charge uh, between some transverse modes, alpha and beta. Uh, now, First, be, be, before I talk about those matrix elements, uh, let me show you how, how the impurity potential itself looks like. So here we consider impurities at two different positions. One is in the middle of the wire. The other one is near this, this corner. I, I notice here that these two facets are covered by the superconductor. So at the position of the impurity itself, uh, Z equals zero, so cuts through the impurity. Uh, the amplitudes of the two potentials are similar. However, if we go away like 10 nanometers along the wire, away from the position of the impurities, uh, the impurity inside, I mean, in the middle of the wire uh, has a significantly larger a potential than the impurity that that's, that it's close to the interface with the superconductor. And this is a nice illustration of the uh, screening by the superconductor of the uh, charge impurity that's inside the wire, which is very effective for this impurity, much less effective for this one. Uh, next, let's look at the self-consistent effective potential. In other words, those matrix elements that I mentioned earlier. Um, here we have, we have an example for, for uh, states that are in the fourth uh, transverse band. And uh, we consider both a, a positively charged impurity as well as a negatively charged impurity. The, the black lines, are the intraband contributions, while the dashed lines correspond to, to intra, I mean, sorry, the, the, the black lines were the intraband and the dashed lines correspond to, to uh, off diagonal elements with the nearby uh, bands, three and five respectively. Notice that uh, the, the characteristic amplitude of, of these matrix elements is of a few MeV, uh, and the uh, off-diagonal matrix elements are smaller, but of the same order of magnitude. Now, uh, we can understand uh, the, the qualitative behavior, the qualitative dependence of these matrix elements on the position along the wire away from the impurity, if we consider that the, the full um, uh, effective potential is basically a sum of the contribution that it's given by the matrix element of the uh, impurity potential itself, plus the contribution coming from the redistribution of free charge in the wire. Uh, as you as you can can see here, uh, the the contribution cam coming from the uh, redistributed charge, in other words, the screening due to the to the free charge in the wire, it's of the same order of magnitude as the contribution from the impurity potential itself. One can show that uh, this this uh, full potential, this this black line, can be well approximated by a phenomenological uh, function that is basically a sum of, of two exponentials that uh, are characterized by some amplitudes and some decay lengths. 
Moreover, one can show that these parameters are not completely uh, independent. So in, in practice, one could, one could model this type of, of charge impurity contribution using two independent uh, parameters. Now the question is, okay, how does depend the amplitude, for example, of, of this uh, effective potential on the position of the impurity within the wire? And here is uh, an example. So uh, here we consider impurities at various position across the transverse cross section of the wire and look at the, the corresponding amplitude of the matrix alma. As you can see, this amplitude has maxima here and here. And those are the regions where the corresponding transverse mode, the second mode, has maximum amplitude. To characterize uh, this type of position dependent dependence of the amplitude, uh, we basically uh, select 169 of uniformly distributed position along the wire and, and basically do a histogram of the, the corresponding amplitudes. And we look at the dependence of, of this on basically the, the occupation of the wire. In other words, uh, as we vary the back gate voltage, we will have a certain number of occupied uh, transverse modes. So for example, uh, here, if, if we apply no uh, gate voltage for the back gate, there will be uh, four occupied modes for the parameters uh, chosen for this calculation. If you apply a negative potential, then some of these modes will be depleted and there will be fewer modes occupied. On the other hand, if you apply a positive gate potential, you can occupy more, more of these transverse modes. And the corresponding uh, effective potentials that are relevant for a certain value of VG will be the, the, the matrix elements of the impurity potential and the redistribution uh, of the charge uh, with the particular for the particular transverse mode that it's closest to the chemical potential. And this is what it's shown on, on this diagram. So for example, here, if the, if the gate potential is uh, about minus 0.3 volt, then the system will have the chemical potential near but the bottom of the second band, n equals two. The corresponding amplitudes the distribution of the corresponding amplitudes is shown here. So the, the, the orange line shows the uh, median of the amplitude, which is uh, about 1.5 MeV. The box corresponds to the 25% to 75% range, and the whiskers are the full range of amplitudes, which, as you can see, can go to up to or uh, eight milli electron volt. Similar uh, distributions can be seen for, for the other occupations. Uh, the typical amplitude, it's on the order of 1.5 to MeV. Similarly, this is the, the, the characteristic decay length along the wire uh, of, the, of the corresponding potential. As you can see, the, the typical characteristic length scales are on the order of 10 nanometers or so, okay? Uh, for comparison, uh, th these are the results where we do not consider screening by the superconductor. So we just eliminate the contribution coming from screening from the superconductor. As you can see, the amplitudes are, are a little bit higher, but not much higher, perhaps by a factor of two at most. And uh, the characteristic uh, uh, decay lengths are also slightly higher, but not by a lot. That means that, that uh, if charge impurities are, are present in the system, uh, screening by the superconductor cannot completely uh, uh, eliminate their effect. Uh, next, we consider the case when we have 
more than one of these impurities. So we assume that, that we are in a regime of uh, low or intermediate uh, density of impurities. So we neglect the correlations that, that could, could uh, uh, be due to, to having many of these impurities. Uh, and basically we, 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 we uh, construct these impurity potential using the result of the sim single impurity calculation, self-consistent Schrodinger Poisson calculation that I briefly uh, talked about earlier. So here it's an example of a specific disorder realization when we have uh, basically five impurities per micron, which would correspond to this, this sort of uh, uh, density in three-dimensional density. And another example where we have three times as many, so 15 impurities per, per micron. We consider a, a, a charge neutral system. So we have an equal number of, of, of positive and negative charge impurities. Uh, in general, uh, so th these are two specific disorder realization. Uh, uh, if you do uh, disorder averaging, one can calculate, for example, the, the correlation associated with this impurity potential. And again, uh, one can see the, the, the characteristic length scale here, which is on the order of tens of nanometers. The, the amplitude of this, of this correlation scales with the impurity density. So basically, uh, uh, the, the, the main idea here is that if one uh, wants to, to uh, reduce uh, disorder effects due to these charge impurities, one has to reduce the density of these impurities uh, correspondingly. OK, so uh, let's investigate uh, the effect of the, these impurities on the low energy physics uh, of the hybrid system. It, it, it is convenient to in, introduce some, some uh, theoretical tools that would characterize this effect. And I'm giving here two examples. First is what we call the Marana separation length. Basically, uh, this is the, the distance between two Majorana modes. So this is the expectation value of the position along the wire for a given Majorana mode, uh, left and right Majorana mode as associated with the low energy BDG state. Here, this F is just a filter function that would select only those modes that are within a small energy window near zero energy. Uh, another useful, so this, 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 this is the, the, the Majorana separation. Another useful uh, quantity is the edge to edge correlation, C, C uh, which we define basically as the square root of these W, which are the weights of the low energy modes at the left and right uh, edges of the, of the system. Again, these weights are considered within, within some, some small uh, length scale away from the corresponding edge, uh, this length scale being comparable to the diameter of the wire, so 100 nanometer. Uh, again, here we filter only those states that are within a small window uh, near zero energy. Uh, to see how, how these uh, quantities uh, look like for a clean system, we have those, those maps that I talked about earlier. So this map would give you the, the Majorana separation as a function of Zeeman field and chemical potential. As one can clearly see the Majorana separation, it's on the, of the order one, so length of the wire inside the topological region and zero otherwise. So basically that tells us that within this region, we have well-separated Majorana modes uh, corresponding to, to the topological superconducting phase. Uh, similarly, within this region, there, there is a strong edge-to-edge -edge correlation uh, 
in here, the correlation can be, I mean, the maximum of this correlation is, is one if the states are very localized near the end uh, and basically the, the corresponding weight becomes one. And uh, at larger value of the Zeeman field, this correlation decreases simply because the characteristic length scale of the Majoranas increases and only part of its weight will be within the small window uh, at the end of the wire that we include in the calculation of this weight. So now having these tools, let's see how, how uh, what disorder would do. Uh, so in the presence of disorder, uh, the uh, Marana separation and the edge-to-edge -edge correlation, it's suppressed within the topological regime. That means that, for example, in this region here, uh, there will be no edge-to-edge -edge correlation for this particular system. Uh, in, uh, in, in some cases, there are, for example, like, like here, there, there are still Majoranas that are pretty well separated, but they will not be visible in an edge-to-edge -edge correlation quantity. So to measurements done at local measurements that done at the edge of the wire. Uh, to understand better what, what, uh, what these features uh, uh, represent, let's take a cut at mu equals zero along these phase diagrams. The corresponding energy spectrum looks like that. So one can clearly see a Majorana mode that sticks near zero energy. And then some other uh, low energy modes like this one, which becomes gapped at a certain value of the Zeeman field. Now, we can also calculate the corresponding Majorana wave function. So first let's consider gamma equals 0 0.5. So a point here, uh, the lowest energy mode, this, this uh, red mode uh, corresponds to two Majoranas, the red one and the green one uh, located at the opposite uh, edges of the system. Uh, by the way, this is a wire five microns long, okay? The next mode uh, the, uh, corresponds to two Maranas that are partially separated and are located in the vicinity of the left uh, uh, edge of the system. Now, on the other hand, if we go to some other value of the magnetic field, gamma equals 10, uh, sorry, one, MEV, for example, here, uh, the red and uh, blue Majoranas corresponding to the slowest energy mode are still well separated. However, the green Majorana, it's not located exactly at the edge of the left edge, but away from the edge. So because of the disorder, this Majorana was pushed further inside the wire. As a consequence here, there will be no edge-to-edge -edge correlation because this green Majorana uh, remains invisible from the point of view of a local probe applied to the left edge of the system. Uh, indeed, if we calculate the differential conductance from tunneling for tunneling into the left and right edges of the system, the, the two uh, maps look different. So this is the left, uh, the left conductance. So one can see the, the Majorana mode corresponding to a, a well-defined zero bias peak up to some uh, Zeeman field on the order of 0.7, so about here, when basically uh, the, the my, the corresponding Majorana mode, this green mode, moves toward the middle of the, of, the, of the system and becomes invisible. On the other hand, if you look from the right edge, this red mode, red Majorana mode is always there and you basically can see the corresponding zero bias peak for the whole range of Zeeman fields. Now, if we take another cut at some higher value of, of mu here, we expect, uh, well, 
large separation everywhere and pretty good edge to edge correlation. And that's indeed the case. So at, at any value of the field within this range, the, the two Maranas corresponding to the lowest energy mode are located at the opposite edges of the wire. Uh, here also we show how the, the states look in the trivial regime. There will be uh, some in-gap modes, some in-gap Andreev modes uh, that uh, correspond to strongly overlapping Marana modes, one near the left edge, the other one near the right edge of the system. Uh, the corresponding uh, differential conductance traces are consistent with, with, uh, with the uh, spectrum and the, the spatial distribution of the Majorana modes. So indeed, one can see a, a zero bias peak both from the left and the right. Uh, notice that from the left uh, at low values of the Zeeman field, one can see these, these dispersing modes associated with this, this excited state here, okay? which basically it's localized near the left end of the wire. Uh, okay, uh, if, if now we, ask, we are asking about the low energy states that are in the topologically uh, nominally non-topological region, so in, in this region here, uh, we can take a cut along, along uh, the, this uh, value of the Zeeman field. We can see that, okay, in the topological region, we have some, some Marana mode protected by a gap, while in the non-topologically topological region, there are still low energy modes, but the gap that protects them, it's tiny, okay? If you look at these modes, at their Majorana components, interestingly, they are partially separated. So for both these states marked by these dashed lines, uh, if you look at the first lowest two uh, energy modes, they consist of partially separated Majoranas as one can show in these, in these plots. Now, uh, if we uh, take the corresponding maps, zero bias conductance maps, uh, they will look differently from the left and right edges of the system. And one can even define some, some correspondent of the edge to edge correlation by simply taking the geometric average of the left and right zero bias conductance. Notice that this maps looks qualitatively like the calculated edge to edge correlations that I defined earlier. So the main features uh, in, the, in, the, in the two maps correspond to one another, which means that basically uh, 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 simply mapping the, the, the zero bias conductance at the left and right and taking this type of, type of uh, geometric average can provide uh, a useful information about the correlations that exist in the system. Now, if we increase the, the, the density of impurity, uh, as shown here, what happens is that the correlations within the nominally topological region reduces further and more stuff emerging emerges in the nominally non-topological region, okay? Still, we have, we have uh, uh, many, many uh, uh, regions here that show quite large Majorana separations, but typically those do not translate into strong edge to edge correlations, okay? Uh, if we compare these maps with the corresponding uh, zero bias conductance maps, left, right, and the edge to edge uh, correlation, uh, there are some, some qualitative features that are similar in, 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 in these type of maps. The significant difference occurs from, from this type of ringy features, which are not shown in the in, in, in the maps uh, for the Marana separation or the edge to edge correlation. To understand where these features occur from, uh, we just take a cut at mu equals three through one of these features. The corresponding spectrum looks like that. 
we can see that the lowest energy mode corresponds to two Marana modes that are partially separated spatially and are located near the right end of the wire, while the first excited states correspond to a, to a trivial Andreev bound states consisting of two overlapping Marana modes. Uh, if we look at the corresponding uh, uh, tunneling features, uh, at the left, we, we see these Marana, sorry, these Andreev bound states, and it, it, it's very pronounced at the left ed edge of the system. While on the other hand, at the right edge of the system here, one can see the, the partially separated Marana mode, which basically crosses zero energy at this value of the, of the Zeeman field, then splits again and crosses again. So one, one can see a feature of this sort. Now, this is very reminiscent of many of the, of the, of the uh, experimental results uh, that uh, one, can, one can see in the literature. Uh, and as I said, this is associated with this type of ring-like feature in the, in, the, in the conductance map. Actually, one can check all of these ring-like features, and they are all associated with this, this type of partially separated Marana modes. So in some sense, this is like a, like a Marana oasis. It's, it's Marana physics, but these are not well-separated uh, topological Majorana modes. Now, to further uh, 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 emphasize the, 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 the importance of, of this spatial separation, let me just quickly discuss uh, the, the issue of uh, quantization of this conductance. So again, I take a, a specific uh, uh, disorder realization and the corresponding conductance map. Now here, uh, the transparency of the, of the tunnel barrier is increased so that the, the, the conductance values are higher than in the previous calculations. And uh, basically, it is very useful to apply a sort of filter of this data by just showing uh, regions that have nearly quantized uh, conductance. So this blue is within 5% of the quantized value. Uh, yellow, it's everything above. And this light blue, it's everything below. So in here, as you can see, there is a, a, a fairly large region of quantized conductance in the topological regime and some smaller regions outside. So now let's consider four different disorder realization corresponding to these, uh, these four columns. And let's increase the amplitude of the corresponding uh, disorder profile. At very low amplitude, uh, you have basically uh, quantized conductance inside the topological regime. This is good Majorana physics. As disorder increases, you start to lose the quantized conductance inside the topological regime but you get some quantized islands outside the nominally topological regime. Uh, furthermore, at even higher values of the, of the disorder, there might be no quantized island at all in the nominally topological regime and not even outside it, uh, but that depends on the specific disorder realization. So here I want to emphasize, so I believe that probably the, the experimental situation, it's closer to the strong disorder situation, or uh, perhaps even like this, where you don't even have quantized uh, islands, blue islands, only these, these yellow islands. Uh, to understand uh, the, the quasi-particles that are associated with the formation of these islands, let's take uh, two cuts, one through this yellow island and another one through this blue island. So this cut would correspond to a, a, a zero bias peak that exceeds the quantized value. As you can see, it reaches almost four E squared over H. 
On the other hand, cutting through the blue island gives you a nice quantized plateau, okay? Now you can vary the barrier, the, the, the barrier height for the blue island, uh, of course, the, the amplitude of the, oh, sorry, for the blue line, uh, the amplitude will depend on the, on the barrier uh, height. For the other, for, on the other hand, for this quantized plateau, there is a significant stability of the plateau with respect to the applied uh, barrier. Uh, now, if you look at the states that are responsible for the, these features, this non-quantized island, it's, it's generated by a trivial Andreev bound state, which consists of two overlapping Marana modes. On the other hand, the plateau, it's, uh, uh, it's generated by two partially separated Marana modes. Uh, one of them coupling strongly to the probe that it's here at the left, the other one not. And uh, with that, I will uh, conclude my, my, my uh, talk. So basically there are different Mirana signatures uh, and the fate of them depends strongly on disorder. Uh, so for example, as far as the low energy modes that stick to zero, uh, uh, they occur even at strong disorder. Uh, and they could be generated by Mayranas, by these partially separated Mayrana modes, also for, called quasi Mayranas, or by trivial Andreev bound state or generic class D quasi particles. Uh, so uh, seeing zero bias peaks, it's not extremely helpful in distinguishing these mechanisms. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, seeing the topological phase boundaries in these maps, uh, it's uh, uh, much more relevant, but it requires a significantly lower value of disorder. The, uh, seeing the, the, the typical uh, topological phase boundaries will require the presence of either Maharanas or quasi Maharanas. Here, uh, these also could, could, could generate phase boundaries if the, if the potential at the end of the wire is not uniform, but I, I, I didn't discuss the details of that. Now, as far as quantized conductance is, is concerned, I will distinguish between quantized conductance plateaus and quantized conductance islands. The plateaus could be generated by Maharanas, quasi Maharanas, or, or generic class D particle, because even if you have one of these Andreev bound states, which generates a, a yellow island, the yellow island has blue quantized boundaries. If you fine tune the system to a boundary of a, of a yellow island, you will get some small uh, conductance plateau. But that doesn't mean necessarily that you have a Majorana there. On the other hand, if you have a, a finite size uh, quantized island in, in, in a two dimensional space, that is generated by other, either a Majorana or a partially separated Majorana. Finally, edge-to-edge -edge correlation, it's very difficult to obtain because in the presence of disorder, even if you have good Majoranas in the system, nothing guarantees that there will be uh, at the edges of the system. At least one of them could shift away from the edge and then that would, of course, destroy the edge-to-edge uh, -edge correlation. For braiding, probably even lower levels of disorder is required. So to give my, my version of the good, the bad, and the, the ugly, uh, the bad is that probably we're deep inside this desert of disorder. The good is that water exists. So even if we see these features associated, for example, with uh, quasi Majoranas, that is good indication that Majorana physics is present. In, in particular, you have spin orbit coupling, for example. Uh, the ugly is, uh, okay, 
it will take time to reduce the disorder to levels that will allow us to have good, robust uh, Maranas in the topological regime. In other words, to reach the Marana C. Uh, as urgent tasks for T theory, one has to discuss other types of disorder that may emerge in these systems and uh, produce maps over larger domains in the, in, the, in the relevant parameter space. On the other hand, for characterization, we need detailed maps over the large control parameter windows. I'm pretty sure that some of these data already exist, but it should be made available uh, to get an idea where we are in this, in this desert of disorder. Of course, in the end, if this problem will be solved, if it will be solved by improvements in the uh, material growth and device engineering, I have no specific recommendation there. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for a very uh, interesting and wonderful talk. And now it's open to questions. I have questions, but I discuss physics with Tudor all the time. So I would let others ask questions, but listening to his talk, something that I explicitly did not discuss with him came up in my head. So I'm going to ask it, but I want others to ask first. Just please uh, speak up if you have a question. Hi, Tudor. This is Andre from Station Q. Hey. I have a question. Uh, in your approach, do you consider a case when there is like multiple overlapping impurities? Because I, no. I had an well, that, that was the, 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 the assumption for that the impurity concentration is low enough that they do not overlap. So the disorder in other words, the typical distance between impurities is smaller compared to those lambda, those characteristic decay links. Which makes sense. You don't want to have too many of them. But basically, your disorder strength is propor is directly proportional to that number. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, is there any other question? So Tudor, let me ask you my question. It's a very uh, general kind of question, which usually you and I don't discuss. We usually are workers, you know. So uh, from a purely strict RG viewpoint, which as you know, I do not like because it just tells you what is possible, doesn't tell you anything about what is probable. Uh, there are just two phases in this system, a topological superconductor and Anderson local addition. There is nothing else, okay? That means if you go to thermodynamic limit, these are the two phases. Right, so the question now is, everything we are seeing here is crossover physics. That's all experiments here also, crossover physics, okay? And the whole question we are discussing is, well, is this crossover physics closer to topological phase or closer to Anderson localized phase? So now the question is, in the, let's say, let's do the work that I'm not involved in, let, that is better for me to ask a question on that. The, the yellow and blue pictures that you had towards the end, there, uh, can you somehow quantify the topological content of some, if you put some figure up, I can show you. This is the last few things you showed here, for example, right? So you go from this various impurity and it's all very clear. I know what's going on. Um, we can hiding and I can convert our figures this way and it's all makes perfect sense. But suppose I ask you, let's take the middle row 2.5 V impurity and let's go to the last column. Okay, the absolute last column here, here. Let's go to the, this big blue region just above your red line here. I ask you, okay, so there you have some quantized Meorana. What is topological content? Because unless you know the topological content, we don't know what braiding will give or anything. I mean, I'm not saying I know the answer. I'm asking you, what would be the operational way you will approach that? So what I can say about this one is that it will contain partially separated Maranas, 
but there is a characteristic length scale. So, so the separation will be finite. So you can have a wire right. kilometer long. So you are still the... I totally agree with you. Everything you are saying, there is no disagreement. But if I do braiding, what am I going to see? Because in the end, topological or not, is what I mean by braiding, right? Well, here, I'm pretty sure nothing. Good. Because, right. because basically these right. are strongly overlapping the gaps that yeah. protect them are small yeah. so these are useless for for yeah. for right. braiding you and i agree my point is agree. that sure if, that again we go back to you know you gave a very detailed thank you by the way even i learned something from it and you and i talk all the time uh basically showed the theorem that i emphasize all the time quantization is not equivalent to memorandum you could see a twist curve over H quantization, quote unquote quantization, for a large number of reasons. That doesn't mean you have seen topological memory. Yeah. You have seen something yeah. close, and you should keep on working, but that by itself is not a big deal. That means even if this nature paper was not retracted, it is not a big deal, which is what I always emphasize in my talk. Yeah, it's called Mayorana quantization. So what? They saw some quantization. That does not mean they saw Mayorana. Yeah. So but my, my only point is that that seeing such a large quantized island, it's a it's a sign that you are not very far from this regime. Absolutely. And okay. in the so if you are here, on the other hand, yeah. it's a little bit more disappointing. <laughs> I totally agree. So this way, this figure is quant quantifying in some loose manner the the which crossover where in the crossover, you know this this your desert and water, that's crossover, right? Water is one phase and desert is other phase. Yeah. And you are always in, you know, somewhere in between. And this is shows that. And, uh, okay, good, thank you. Yeah, I, I think I totally agree. Uh, I think there is a question in the chat and I can read it. Uh, do two dimension and the three dimension of marijuana experiment yield similar result or are they different? No. Uh, I didn't exactly understand. Can well, you repeat yeah. the question? Yeah. Yeah, it's there is a question. In the three question. dimension. Yeah. Talk about two dimension and three dimension. Uh, three three dimension in, in what sense? Uh, the wire being considered yeah, as a three dimensional I, I, system? I, I, or? That is taking the question very seriously. In, in three dimensions, there are no Meorana. So, so two dimension and three dimension would not yield similar results if you have Meorana. If you don't have Meorana, of course, they can yield similar results because you're seeing something else. So, um, so in three dimension, you cannot have Meorana. Meoranas are two dimensional objects. I mean, I think that's the only possible answer. Yeah. Okay, if there is any other question. Well, I, I just want to say a word if there are no other questions. First, I want to thank all the speakers. Most of them are probably not in the audience anymore, but I still want to thank all of them. First, because they promptly accepted the invitation. Second, because they gave all, all of them gave uh, you know, compelling talks. I listened to every minute of every talk. And third, to my total surprise, they all kind of followed my instructions that the talk should be very substantive and very technical and go into all the depth. So I learned a great deal from each talk and I am very grateful for all the speakers paying such, you know, giving such useful talks. And I also want to thank four other individuals, uh, you know, who uh, were neither speakers nor me. You know, I only invited the speakers, chose the topics, and then I handed everything over to Rebecca who did all the work. So she's behind the scenes, she did all the work. And then the three persons who chaired the sessions today and recorded them and so on, which is actually non-trivial work, amount of work, you know. So that's Yang Zi, Jaideep Sao, and Ru Xing Zhang. Thank you all. And I just want to announce our next conference in this series is on May 17th, five weeks from now on Monday. That is called Quantum. It's a very, very broad conference. The poster will come out any day. But just to give you an idea, this conference has people like Emmanuel Bloch and Marcus Greiner and you know, Ignacio Sirach, but also has people like Andrew Childs and, and uh, uh, Chan uh, who are you know, hardcore quantum algorithm and quantum error correction people. So it's, uh, and Mason Barkeshli, topological quantum field theory is going to be very, very broad. 
on quantum information, quantum computing, quantum emulation, and uh, quantum simulation. And the third conference is also all set. That's January, uh, June 14th, nine weeks from today. And that's on this very hot topic right now in condensed matter physics. That's called twisted. That's twisted bilayer graphene and twisted uh, dichalcogenite system. And that also, every conference, the eight people I invited in the, my first group accepted. So, you know, they all accepted right away. So every conference I got exactly the people I wanted. The last one has people like Pablo Harillo Herrero, and, you know, Andrea Young, Cody Dean, Ashwin Vishwanath. So you are looking forward to some very exciting conferences. We'll all be exhausted, eight hours of solid physics, but we'll learn a lot. Thank you all for attending and I hope everybody enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you. I'll now start recording.